good morning. As folks are joining in, we can get started. Uh, my name is Mara Carlin. I direct strategic studies in the Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins SICE. I am really excited that we have this tremendous group of, of, of very smart thinkers to help us think through civil military relations. Before I introduce them and get started with our program, I want to spend a moment on administrivia because we have hundreds of participants, which is fantastic, and I'm assuming hundreds of really bright and thoughtful participants as well. And I want to make sure that we can hear from you as well. So I have a handful of questions, of course, that I'll ask uh, my esteemed colleagues. And I would ask you all to start plugging in your questions into the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And I'll try to consolidate as many of those and then shoot them over to folks. To the extent there's a specific person you want to ask that question to, please note that. And above all, let me underscore, I will prioritize questions from students. So if you are a student, please make that clear when you're asking your question, since this is especially your opportunity. So let me introduce uh, the folks that we have here today. We have the SICE Dean, Elliot Cohen, a longtime professor at Johns Hopkins SICE, and of course, uh, the author of the Tome of Civil Military Relations, Supreme Command, which if you haven't memorized at this stage, of course, you have wasted your time so far. Let me then turn to Paula Thornhill, retired Brigadier General and now a professor at Johns Hopkins SICE, Paula Thornhill just came out with a fantastic new book on demystifying the American military, a fantastic primer for folks really trying to understand that institution. You should also add that to your pandemic reading list. Let me then turn to Professor Nora Ben Sahel, also a professor at SAIS, uh, who has uh, taught all over Washington and worked at, I think, just about every think tank as well, longtime smart thinker. And she, along with her illustrious colleague, retired Lieutenant General, Dave Barno, who is also a professor at SICE with a fantastic career in the Army and elsewhere, have a great new book coming out, I think in a few weeks, in fact, um, looking at uh, adaptation under fire. How do militaries make change when they really need to, when the imperative is so strong and yet it is nonetheless terribly difficult? So at a minimum, if you learn nothing over the next hour and 15 minutes, you should go to the independent bookstore next to you and please start ordering three fantastic books. So our plan today is to talk civil military relations. We are, I think, in the throes of the civil military relations Super Bowl over the last few weeks. The motto is no one wins, perhaps for this one. And what I wanted to start out with is getting the thoughts of each of our speakers on the events of the first week or so of June. This is the, uh, the, the image, I think, that was seared in so many folks' minds of General Milley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the senior most uh, general in the U.S. military in combat fatigues, walking to St. John's Church, which may really become an iconic symbol for folks studying this topic uh, uh, in the future. So we saw him walk across, uh, walk across Lafayette Square with the president. We saw um, uh, statements by him, the Secretary of Defense, and others over those, those, ne those, those coming days. And there's been a lot of talk that this was a genuine civil military relations crisis. Uh, that is at least what my perspective is. But I'd like to get the perspective of my colleagues. And what I'd ask them to do is, is actually hold up fingers, one to 10, uh, with their assessment. How worrisome was that first week of events uh, in, in June? So one to 10, are you not terribly worried about what's going on? It was this, say, a two or a three. Did you really feel like this was a profound crisis for the United States? And if so, you'd hold up, say, seven, eight, or nine. All right, so we're seeing a five from uh, Dean Cohen, a seven from Professor Thornhill, a seven from Professor Bensahel, and Professor Barna, what do you think? He may be frozen, perhaps, so we uh. will wait to hear his uh, in a moment. Okay, we got a six, great. All right, good to hear. We, we got a six from him. So let me turn, turn to each of you. Tell us a, a little bit um, about why you have made that assessment. Let me start with you, Dean Cohen. Um, so I, you know, at the time, I thought it was very bad in, in uh, two ways. One, obviously, the optics of uh, General Milley being there, including in his, uh, in his fatigues. Uh, I would also add Secretary of Defense Esper's comment about dominating the battle space, talking about American cities. I think the reason why I may be a little bit less alarmed than some of the others is they both walk um, their... In, in the case of uh, General Milley, his presence, in the case of General uh, of Secretary Esper, his words back. 
Uh, they said all the right things in formal statements about um, the allegiance of the military to the Constitution. Uh, I think they both took some pretty serious lessons away from that and in doing that uh, irritated the president. Uh, the reason why I'm still pretty alarmed is, you know, we, we've also seen is a lot of retired military speak out in ways that are very directly critical of the president. You know, we've gradually been working our way to a norm of keeping um, uh, retired general officers out of partisan politics, which is a good thing. I think that's going to break down in this. And then finally, I would just say that the larger issue of presidential powers to use the military really was surface for all of us. And the truth is the president's got a lot of power, which he has not thus far used. Thanks for sharing that. Professor Ben Sahel, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I weighed in at a seven. Uh, at the end of the first week of June, I was an eight, you know, bordering on nine to 10. Um, I've revised that slightly downward for many of the reasons that Dean Cohen just mentioned. Um, but I still put it at a seven, despite all of those things, even though I agree that they have done as good a job of trying to walk this back as is possible under the circumstances, because I don't think the American people are following the details of this. We as scholars and, you know, the elite level of civil military relations, I think some of that has been damped down. But the American people still now have an image, regardless of what uh, you know, both Secretary Esper and Chairman Milley said of a, you know, the highest ranking military officer in the nation in the background of the president using force on unarmed protesters violating a constitutional right to peacefully protest. That image will have repercussions uh, for the way that the American people view the military that will endure, even though, as I said, I agree with Dean Cohen that they have walked this back as best they could. Thanks for sharing that, Professor Bensell. Professor Thornhill, uh, I'm curious to hear your perspective, particularly because you had a superb piece in War on the Rocks yesterday, in which you were noting that you're in Ohio and a lot of people seem to be surprised by this media hullabaloo. Curious to hear your thoughts on that as well. Uh, th that's correct. And uh, I will um, uh, reinforce what Dean Cohen and uh, Dr. Bensahel said, um, number one, in, in terms of the efforts to walk back. Um, uh, number two, in Ohio, the question was, what's a civ mill conflict? What's a civ mill crisis? That expression does not exist in Ohio. Um, so Ohioans were concerned, but they didn't know how to process it. Um, the other part that we're missing is the impact on the military itself. Um, I think that the voice that has not been heard is those in uniform um, and has trust been broken. Um, and I think that's something we need to explore. Thank you for those thoughts. And Professor Barno, what are yours? No, I rated uh, my concern at the level of six, and I think that's stayed about steady. I think this is a very serious event, but I don't think it's a you know looming crisis. Uh, again, Dean Cohen's comments about uh, General Milley uh, actually apologizing in front of an audience in a live in a uh, video recorded address to the National Defense University up and coming military students about losing situational awareness and creating the perception that the military was involved in domestic politics. That's a very strong statement for a sitting chairman of the Joint Chiefs to make to a military audience of uh, rising lieutenant colonels, colonels, Navy captains out there. So the, the, I do think we've, uh, we've backed away from the precipice in a sense, but I'm, I'm considerably worried about the next four months uh, there and, and potentially beyond. Uh, into, you know, certainly the inauguration and perhaps even a second term for President Trump. This, this has made clear, again, as Dean Cohen pointed out, that the president has an immense amount of power to employ the active duty federal military in the United States of America by invoking the Insurrection Act, which allows him to override even the objections of governors to employ those forces under his control for whatever purpose he chooses, essentially. That, that is the you know, cre creates the potential for a tremendous crisis within the military about what's the constitutional obligation of the military to, you know, protect the rights enshrined in the constitution at the same time, you know, be part of the chain of command led by the commander in chief, the president, and, and exercise those duties responsibly. We came up to the edge of that, I think, here a couple of weeks ago in Washington when federal troops were brought in, in the outskirts of Washington, troops from the 82nd Airborne Division that were ready to be used downtown in Washington, D.C., and, and ultimately pulled back. That, that hasn't happened in, since 1968, as I recall, in the Capitol, and, and the president has tremendous authority there. So I'm still quite worried about this. 
Thank you for sharing that. And I would recommend to the audience, if you haven't read General Milley's speech, it's worth doing so, although maybe this is the nerdy professor in me. I quibble a lot with the emphasis on perception of. I actually don't think there was a perception of. I think he, he quite clearly had done something inappropriate. And I, uh, I fear perhaps that the language was, was more acute than perhaps it, need, it needed to be. Um, Professor Berner, you, you walked us through these next few months and your worries. There's a great piece in the Washington Post by uh, Saisa Lam John Gans today uh, talking about those concerns over these next few months, what the military might be asked to do. You know, to state the obvious, we have an election coming up in particular. I'd like to hear from folks what, what is it that you would like to see uh, happen over these next few months? What is it that you want to see the military do and the Secretary of Defense do over these, com uh, over these coming months um, internally to, to rebuild faith and also vis-a-vis -vis American society? Uh, I'm going to start, if you don't mind, with you, Professor Barno, and then I'll go to Ben Sahel Cohen and Thornhill. Right. Well, I think ideally I'd like to see nothing happen in this domain and have the military be completely out of the upcoming, uh, you know, the intense part of the election campaign going into November. Uh, but I, I think, you know, number one, hopefully there won't be any other domestic uh, crises of the nature that we saw in early June that would precipitate the possibility of federal troops being involved in somehow putting down those protests. I think hopefully that's unlikely. But I, I do think that the president will be inclined towards using military audience as a backdrop and perhaps a prop for some of his campaign activities out there. And I think Secretary Esper and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Service Chiefs need to be very clear that that will not be acceptable by starting to make those public pronouncements to their own forces now to indirectly send that message to the White House. There may be a point where they actually need to have that conversation with the President preemptively before he moves in that direction. Uh, he's shown that proclivity before they, need, they clearly are aware that he could do that again. They need to start having those conversations today. Absolutely, thank you for that. Professor Bensell, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I, I think that you know this, the reason why this issue was so dramatic and why I think you saw so many uh, retired uh, general officers and admirals speak out on this is, as I mentioned before, there was a fairly clear constitutional issue here, right? The issue at stake was the peaceful right to protest. In that sense, it's unambiguous what happened. I don't think, you know, we may see the use of the military uh, in some of the scenarios and, and issues that, that uh, uh, General Barno just described in situations that are a lot less clear than that one, where uh, you know, the, the desire to resist where the feelings of those in the military that, you know, they swear an oath to the Constitution, not to the president, uh, you know, where that's much less intention if it's not something that is so crystal clear. So, you know, in some sense, the, you know, the reason why this crisis unfolded as it did was because there was that tension. We're not going to necessarily see that in the future uh, unless, again, there are unambiguously peaceful protests that the military is called in. The military may well be called to do things ranging from being a political prop in the background all the way to getting involved in uh, domestic unrest where it's not nearly as clear uh, what the limits are. Thank you for that. Dean Cohen, what do you think? So a couple of thoughts. One, one is I think everybody, we, you know, we, we need to remind ourselves the it was not the military that was used to clear Lafayette Park. That was various police, um, uh, federal police of, uh, of different kinds. And it's also important for everybody to understand what they often don't, which is the distinction between National Guard units uh, operating as effectively state militias as opposed to federal units. Uh, beyond that, what I would say is the most important thing I think that can happen between now and the next four months is just a hammering away at the the issue of of what the Constitution says uh, and what civil military norms are of political neutrality, fidelity to the Constitution. And I think uh, in that respect, I, I do think the secretary and the chairman did a very good job. But, the, you know, like any important message, it needs to be delivered repeatedly. And I think it also needs to be reinforced by the retired military as well. So rather, rather than having them jump on uh, the president, which there are plenty of other people willing to do, I think having them affirm that norm and having other and having active duty officers affirm that norm, that's the most important thing uh, that we can do. Thank you for that. And Professor Thorno, what do you think? Um, first of all, I'd like to reinforce what uh, General Barno said. I would like to see nothing. Um, I, I think that that would be wonderfully refreshing. Um, uh, second of all, um, in, in terms of military action, um, second of all is I'd like to see a greater exploration 
of the, the um, implied contract between the American people and the American military. Um, and that has got to occur outside of the beltway. It's got to occur outside of, of the elites, um, including everybody um, in this webinar. Um, and third, that means getting it into civics lessons. We need to talk about the military the same way we talk about the Constitution and civics lessons. And that needs to start in high schools and that needs to start all over the country. Thank you for, uh, for those thoughts. That's really, really useful. Um, I'd like to turn to the chairman and the SECDEF relationship because we've really seen both of those in the news in a pretty spectacular way, uh, obviously, this month. So first, Professor Thornhill, you worked for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I want to get your thoughts on what that relationship should look like. Then I'd like to turn to Professor Barnum, Professor Bensahel, and get your thoughts on what that current relationship between SECDEF Esper and General Milley does look like. Thank you. Um, so starting with, with my thoughts, and um, uh, for those of you who might not know me, the chairman I know um, uh, worked for and knew best was General Richard Myers. Um, I also got to know General Peter Pace um, quite well in his capacity as vice chairman and early on as chairman. Um, in, in conversations with them and observing uh, their interactions with the Secretary of Defense, I think what you want is something that is strong professionally, it's civilized, um, but it is not a friendship. It is not personal. Um, it, is, it, it needs to stay on a, a, on a professional level. Um, it should be iterative. You don't want to agree on everything, but you need to have constant conversations and see if you can iterate to the, to the best course of action. Um, and finally, it's not about dueling point papers. And sometimes folks that um, come from either the Office of the Secretary of Defense or from the Joint Staff, seem to think that it's the best point paper that wins. The point papers are part of the iterative conversation, um, but that's what it is. It's a ongoing, iterative, very professional, civilized relationship. Thank you for that. Professor Barno and Professor Bensell, your thoughts on that current relationship. And then Dean Cohn, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, if, the, if, if General Milley or Secretary Esper gave you a call over these next few months, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I'd start by saying each relationship between a chairman and a, and a secretary of defense is unique and, the, and they're built on their personal relationships, their chemistry, their worldview, and, and they evolve over time. And, and I, I watched uh, Secretary Rumsfeld and uh, General Dick Myers when I was a commander in Afghanistan, and, and that was a relationship that's very different than the one I see between General Milley and Secretary Esper. It's important to recognize that these two individuals both came from the Army where they were the Secretary of the Army and the Chief Staff of the Army respectively for several years and had a close personal relationship in that regard. I think in the current environment, uh, in a lot of ways, Milley is the stronger personality. I think he actually has a stronger relationship with the President. And I think that uh, out of the, the events of the first couple of weeks of June, I think Esper's position is much weaker with the President. Uh, and almost perhaps came to the point of resignation or being fired during that period. Whereas Millie's, I don't think was ever particularly in doubt. The, the good news in that is that I, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Thornhill that they, there has to be a bit of separation or a bit of formality in that relationship that may not be adequate today and that probably needs to be examined for both of these individuals as this goes forward. Great, thank you for those points. Professor Bensell, what would you say? Yeah, I agree with, with what General Barno just said. I would add that I was really, uh, su a bit surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised by the press reporting on this. Again, we don't know what actually happened behind closed doors, but according to the press reporting, uh, it seems as though Milley reacted much more strongly immediately, um, you know, that understood what had just happened and tried to start walking it back a lot earlier than Esper did, although he did eventually come around. To the extent that that's true, it does show a difference in you know, their perspectives, they shouldn't have the same perspective. One is, uh, you know, again, the most senior ranking military officer, the you know, military advisor to the president. That's a very different position than somebody who is inherently political in the Secretary of Defense as a member of the president's cabinet. Um, and again, uh, if the reporting is correct, I was pleasantly surprised to see that Milley seemed to understand the ramifications internally to the force. Uh, immediately, and I think Esper was uh, frankly a little bit late to respond to understand the challenge, the, the scope of the challenge that he was facing. 
Absolutely, P particularly given that one does expect different things from a Secretary of Defense versus a Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. In, ma in many ways, you want your Secretary to ser serve as a buffer of sorts. Um, what, what do you have to say, Dean Cohen? What, what advice might you give? Uh, so first, I would say uh, I completely agree with Dr. Uh, Benzel that it was very impressive how quickly Milley moved. It's also, you know, there's a bit of an issue with uh, Secretary Esper. He said, well, we in the military use the term dominate the battle space. Well, he's the civilian. Civilians aren't supposed to talk that way. Uh, you let the generals talk that way. Look, what it's clear to me that both men know what the norms are. It's clear to me that both of them are chastened by the experience. So I don't, ha I wouldn't wag my finger at uh, at either of them. Uh, what I would say is, you know, you both communicated uh, wonderfully. Keep on communicating that way. Keep on sending that message repeatedly. Uh, you have to do that. And then the second thing I would say is. If we come into some sort of another crisis, uh, one issue that often comes up is, well, should you think about resignation? And my view is you shouldn't at that level be thinking about resignation, but you should be very willing to be fired um, and to say things to the president that the president really does not want to hear. And that, that's actually in some ways a tougher standard. And I, I had a piece to this effect in, in the Atlantic. That'd be my message to them. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, it's really easy, I think, when we talk about civilian control to obsess over the executive branch, but it turns out there is also the legislative branch. I'd like to turn to you, Professor Ben Sahal, and get your thoughts on this one. Uh, SecDef, Esper, and General Milley uh, have refused to testify to Congress around these recent events. What advice would you have uh, for Congress over these coming weeks and months? How should they approach civilian oversight and control? How should the military interact with Congress? And frankly, how perturbed are you by this refusal? Well, it's certainly a violation of a lot of norms that exist. It's not, there's, you know, I, I don't think anything illegal about it. Uh, you know, they don't have to, uh, uh, they're not required in the Constitution to appear before Congress every time Congress asks. That said, during their confirmation hearings, it is standard uh, for both uh, the uh, four-star generals th uh, that lead the military and also for the Secretary of Defense to agree in their uh, uh, confirmation testimony that they will, uh, if confirmed and on request, that they will appear before Congress. Both of that those exact words were uttered by, uh, agreed to by both General Milley and Secretary Esper. So it's a big deal that they uh, decided to not comply with the request to go uh, and testify about this and much speculation that the president uh, told them not to. Um, Look, Congress, I think this issue has died down for now. I think that it was a very big issue two weeks ago. I think that the, uh, you know, interest uh, in the House, particularly uh, from uh, Representative Adam Smith, who heads the HASC, uh, I think that, you know, we're not, I don't think we're headed now towards a confrontation in terms of making them come testify anymore, uh, you know, in, in the immediate future about this. I think that Congress's attention is mostly focused on pandemic relief and trying to craft another bill around that. But at some point, both Secretary Esper and General Milley are going to testify in front of Congress about something, even if it's not a specific hearing about this. And I would, uh, you know, almost guarantee, uh, at least, especially on the House side where the Democrats are are in control, that they will be asked about this and they will have to say something on the record about this. Thank you for those thoughts. Uh, I'd like us to turn to the civilian side of the equation, and then we're going to turn to the retired uh, uh, military side of the equation. So Dean Cohen, getting your thoughts on the civilian side. We have a great question here from recent alum Daniel Gagliano, who's asking for advice to SICE uh, graduates who are going to be civilians. Uh, and, and really, what advice do you have for civilians who are going to be interacting with the military inside the, the Pentagon in particular? Well, uh, that's a tough one because there are a lot of different kinds of civilians and the advice that you might give to somebody who's a uh, deputy assistant secretary or an assistant secretary is uh, different from when you're starting out. Um, I would say certainly when you're starting out and I like, think this is one of the great strengths of um, uh, a size educated student is understand the culture that you're dealing with, understand the norms, uh, a show respect for those, but also indicate that you expect people to live up to those norms. And I think that really becomes the, the, one of the critical challenges for senior civilian leaders uh, to both respect 
those norms and actually and hold the military up to its own standards. The, the thing that, that is uh, destructive, and maybe this isn't for people working in the Pentagon necessarily, has been over the last, for understandable reasons, a, a certain kind of adulation of the military, which is corrupting. Uh, and I think it's possible to show a great deal of respect for military professionals and what they do without um, swooning and uh, giving up uh, sound, sound judgment. And I think we're actually going to be coming, the truth is, I'll just say one other thing. I think we're coming to the end of that period. Because, you know, what's happening in the middle of this pandemic is we're appreciating the, uh, the courage and self-sacrifice of a lot of other people. From, you know, nurses and doctors to people who deliver groceries. Um, and I think that that's actually going to help us establish some perspective and context on what is a, a critical institution and in most ways an extremely admirable one. Thank you. Actually, I want to spend a quick moment on this. You know, we've seen uh, through great books like the one by Corey Shockey and uh, Jim Mattis, Warriors and Citizens, that there's broad support among the American public for the military, but it's also pretty flimsy because, because there's not much depth to that. And I think what I'm hearing from you, Dean Cohen, is there, we're in the throes of sort of redefining the pedestal that we put the military on and who else is on that. And I'd be curious, thumbs up or thumbs down, uh, Professor Barna, Professor Bensel, Professor Thornhill, do you agree? Do you think, say, I'm gonna put words in your mouth, Dean Cohen, three years from now, we will still be in the phase of having redefined heroism or will it be a pedestal in which generally just the US military is on? This, by the way, is a trick I learned from a, uh, being a student of Dean Cohen, so whether or not folks like it. So, so Professor Thornhill, I think, is not compelled by this. Professor Ben Sahel, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, uh, what I wanted to do was to, um, to jump in, first of all, on the, um, on the swooning um, uh, uh, period. Um, I'm old enough, I've seen the military go through these phases before of, of swooning and not swooning. And I think more than anything, um, what we would like is something that's closer to stasis. It's, it's neither good to swoon uh, nor to be dismissive of. Um, and, and I think that it's something that we need to just um, uh, be mindful of. Um, and it looks like I will um, be picking up, um, uh, if somebody can make me the host, um, I will be picking up, I think Dr. Carlin um, has to deal with an emergency. Um, uh, Professor Bensahel, would you like to uh, pitch in on that since you were a, uh, a, a wavering um, thumb also? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, General Barno and I wrote about this in our last column for War on the Rocks, that the prestige of the U.S. military is going to be dimmed um, as a result of the pandemic. And part of it was because of uh, exactly what Dean Cohen said, that, you know, we're learning that other people in our society are putting their lives on the line to serve society, and especially coming out of two long wars where the military role overseas is not uh, as front and center uh, in Americans' minds, not that they've been paying, you know, that close attention to the details, but at least they've known, you know, that we've been fighting in overseas wars. Um, I do wonder how much the adulation for these other heroes of the pandemic, for our medical workers, for, uh, you know, grocery store clerks, for all of the, you know, usually invisible people that make our society function, I am, I don't know how much that adulation is going to continue as the pandemic winds down over a period of time. I mean, uh, you know, we're going to be dealing with the, the virus for a significant period of time in one form or another, even if we're not under lockdown, you know, until there's a vaccine, we're going to be dealing with uh, trying to manage this. And, you know, society is certainly going to be very changed by the pandemic, but I don't know if, uh, you know, that is a temporary or permanent shift. Um, but I do think that the recognition that other people put their lives on the line for the country, uh, you know, whether or not those other people remain on as high a pedestal, I do think that that will, um, you know, help uh, move the military to a more normalized part of, uh, you know, of our society. Great. Dean Cohen. 
Yeah, so just to be clear, it's not so much that I think uh, other groups will displace the military from a pedestal. I think rather that we may see something that's actually healthier than that, which is an appreciation for the ways in which people have to quite frequently in their lives uh, display a certain kind of courage uh, or resilience in the face of adversity, which are those, those are virtues that we associate with the military and properly so, but they're displayed in a lot of walks of life. And so I think in that respect, we may get just closer to a norm where we understand there's a lot of different kinds of pedestals out there. Um, and actually none of us really belong on pedestals. We're, we're human beings and go through all the things that human beings go through. General Barnum. Yeah, I think I would uh, give a couple thoughts that may mitigate that. And, I, and we have written, uh, as uh, Dr. Benchel noted, that we think the prestige of the military is going to dim. But for several decades now, the military has been in polling the most respected institution in America. And that even predates 9-11. Uh, you can understand that that would be the case perhaps over the last 20 years when American soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines have been fighting overseas. That is now diminished significantly. I do think the military uh, will retain a lot of that respect. And I think one of the things that's both encouraging and worrying in is that the Department of Defense and the US military is probably one of the most effectively functioning institutions in American society today. And most Americans at least intuitively recognize that. DOD works, the military works. That's why it apply, it's applied at so many different functions. But I do think the military is gonna recede from the front page of the newspaper and the nightly news, if it hasn't already in the aftermath of this pandemic, partly because it's coming out of these wars. And so it may become a much less visible part of American society, kind of respected you know, in absentia in a way, but perhaps not playing as visible a role as it has for the last uh, 20 years. Great. Um, you know, I'm scrolling through uh, the, the, the questions here, and, and, I, and I'd actually like to ask all the panelists uh, to comment on this, um, uh, starting with Dean Cohen, um, then Dr. Bensahel, and then General Barno. Um, and it's about the role of uh, prominent retired military um, members, um, especially, most notably, former Secretary of Defense Mattis, um, uh, General Powell, Admiral Mullen coming up on the net um, with regards to the to the um, uh, the specific incidents on one June, and then also looking forward to the election. Um, so, uh, starting with you, Dean Cohen, could you offer some thoughts about what your reaction was retrospectively to those senior um, uh, generals and admirals coming up on the net, and what you would recommend going forward? Yeah, I confess I'm really torn on this one. So my, you know, my fundamental position has been from the outset, going back to the Clinton administration, when it became the rage to have retired general officers endorse political candidates, that that's a terrible, terrible precedent. Uh, and it's actually deeply corrupting of the norm of military neutrality in politics because generals never really retired. They have all you know, they're not, they're not being brought on the stage because of their political acumen. They're being brought uh, on the stage because they've got uh, stars on their shoulders. So that, that's the default. Uh, I, I have to confess that I'm in a somewhat, um, like I said, torn position um, because I think this president is so far out of the norm and because I think the dangers that he poses uh, with his finger, with his ability to control the military is so deeply troubling. And I would not say that about any other president, certainly in my lifetime, and indeed I would say throughout military history. You know, if, if this were a contest between Obama and Romney, or you, you pick your pair of Democrat and Republican, I, I would just say, no, retired GOs and flag officers really need to just be silent. That's how they can continue to serve their country when it comes to uh, political endor partisan political endorsements as opposed to commentary on national security issues. This one I, I wrestle with, and I still am not entirely sure where, where I stand, to be perfectly honest. General Barnum. Yeah, I, I share some of that ambivalence. I, I absolutely agree that uh, the retired general officers should not be endorsing political candidates, especially for the office of the presidency. That's a terrible trend that's uh, really only gained momentum in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. This particular election season, uh, we'll see the, yet another version of that. 
And I think that the, based on what we saw here earlier in June, the senior officers who spoke out, which was an extraordinary event for, I think we had four former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, perhaps five, speaking out against uh, the perceptions and, and the reality of having the military in, immersed in this domestic political situation. I think they also will now recede a bit from the scene. And I think most of them, are, I would not expect to see come out supporting one candidate or another in you know, September, October, November. The, the campaigns are going to continue to want to recruit these people of all of all numbers of stars on their shoulders. And I would suggest most of them simply stay out of this. But I do think they have a role to play in talking about policy decision and policy debates. And, and in a sense, that's what we saw Admiral Mullen and others you know, speaking on in June. And Dr. Benson Hill. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that, especially about the role in campaigns. Uh, and, uh, you know, if whatever conventions we have, if they're online or whatever, I think, uh, you know, that trend will unfortunately continue. That's a very dangerous trend and, and it is not a good thing. Um, but I would add that I was less troubled by what the uh, retired general did in response to recent events, the chairman speaking out, the numerous other uh, flag officers who spoke out, they were at least, they were not directly making a partisan endorsement. What they were talking about is reaffirming the apolitical nature of the military, which is a bedrock principle. Now, clearly it was indirectly, it had a political message, right? They were clearly talking about what Trump was doing as wrong and that you have to see it in a partisan lens. But given that they were talking out and that it would be interpreted as a partisan message, at least it was not overtly political and what they were doing was reaffirming one of the most central principles about the role of the military in society. Those are the norms that Trump is violating. They did not weigh in and say, you know, Trump should use force in these situations, but not the others. At the very least, even though it is troubling and it is implicitly political, at least what they were talking about was reaffirming the apolitical nature, which is something we've not seen before when you have people up on stage at conventions and explicitly endorsing candidates. Fantastic. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to go now to a question from a recent graduate. Um, and, it's, and it's building on what happened on um, the 1st of June. And the, and the, the question is, is um, do you think that this recent crisis should inform any kind of broader change um, to how we think about presidential power, how we think about legislative oversight, how we reinforce or enforce um, uh, civil military norms? Um, and, and if the answer is yes, um, what should those changes be? Um, and if the answer is no, why do you think this was an anomaly? Um, and I think I'm gonna stay on the same rotation cycle for this one. So Dean Cohen, I'd like to start with you, please. So I guess uh, part of the context in which I would see this is uh, less civil military relations than um, the executive powers of the presidency. I think there's been this secular trend uh, towards the expansion of the powers of the presidency. A lot of the fault lies with Congress, which has tolerated it in ways that I don't believe it would have in the past. Uh, you know, in, in the past, for example, when we talk about testimony, in the past, if, if, a, if a Secretary of Defense or Chairman, you know, said, I'm just not going to talk to you, there would have been a bipartisan consensus that, oh, yes, you will. Uh, and they would have understood that they better do that. Um, Congress has, in, in many, many ways, yielded to the president on the issue of emergency powers. And that's actually where I would like to see change. If, if we had a somewhat more statesmanlike collection of politicians, this would be something that a, a bipartisan group of legislators would be thinking about how do you address, how do you retain the ability of the we need the president to be able to act in emergencies. Nobody doubts that, but we but we also have to be aware of this uh, this creep of executive uh, discretion, which has really gone, I think, further than uh, was intended by the founders, or than is prudent. General Barno. Yeah, I would I would second that absolutely, and I think the uh, whether it occurs at at the end of this particular term of President Trump, or there's a second Trump administration. Congress at some point in time is going to, in the future, look at 
how much executive power they now realize that a president actually has. The, the, there's been so many elements of executive power that have been viewed as either non-existent or constrained by customs and norms and propriety that no one ever expected them to be violated. Huge numbers of those things have been violated from day one of this particular administration. And, and the, the list continues to grow you know, day after day. The, the events in Washington here in the last uh, few weeks, just the, the most recent example of that. So I think a future Congress is going to take a hard look at how they can perhaps you know, claw back some of this executive power. We saw this happen in the aftermath of Watergate in 1974. Congress went and went in and, and, and went after executive power, but in the years since then, it, it has creeped back to a level and it's probably much greater than even probably some experienced congressmen realize in the emergency powers of the president that Dean Cohen mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Bentel. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I was also going to point to the role of Congress. So, uh, you know, I will just offer endorsing everything uh, uh, they both just said. You know, I think a lot will depend on who wins the, the uh, control of the Senate in the, um, well, in both the House, although I think that's less up for grabs right now than the Senate, in the November elections. Um, if the Democrats take control of the Senate, I think you're going to see uh, some very strong moves towards uh, trying to, uh, you know, shift this balance, trying to put some more constraints on the uh, president's ability to use power. And I would specifically expect uh, a discussion about the 1807 Insurrection Act and uh, putting some sort of controls or conditions on it that still give the president room in, you know, to maneuver in a uh, national crisis, but may come closer to defining what a national crisis is rather than leaving that up to the jurisdiction, uh, excuse me, up to the discretion of the president. So um, uh, thank you. And a corollary question that has popped up um, in relationship to the answers that, that you all have given. Um, and this goes back to um, civilians. And you can define civilians however you would like. Civilian leaders in the Pentagon, civilian leaderships in the executive, um, uh, civilians out in the, in the, you know, the, the, the greater American community or whatever. Um, but the question is, what can civilians do? Define, like I said, the way you would, you would like um, to reverse this trend of politicizing um, the U.S. military. And I've noticed as I, as I scroll through a lot of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Q&A questions, um, is there, there is uh, increased interest in what kind of role should we expect civilians to take on? And how do we, how do we actually think about that civilian role? Um, uh, Dr. Bensahill, it looks like uh, you'd like to speak to that, so I'm going to reverse the order this time. <laughs> Um, I knew you were going to call on me first for this one. <laughs> um, again, so much depends on how you define civilian, right? I just talked about, and we all just talked about the role of Congress in oversight. Um, you know, I think that there is room in a next administration uh, for more civilian oversight within the Pentagon, although I think that's more likely uh, if the Democratic nominee, presumably Joe Biden wins, because if Trump is reelected, you're going to see a lot more of the same. Um, you know, at, at its core, I would like to reinforce, uh, Professor Thornhill, your earlier call for, you know, the broader American public understanding the military uh, through civics education, right? Because I think the American people have an important role to play here. But without understanding the military better, it's impossible for, you know, to ask them to play that role. I'd like to see, for example, um, endorsements of, uh, you know, general officer endorsements of candidates be less relevant because people are less swayed by them and see that as more of a problem. But as you noted, uh, you know, given their ignorance of the military and the fact that they don't pay attention to the military at all, I really think it is going to end up being, uh, you know, the American people are going to have much less of a role in that than I would like to see. I think, you know, it's going to continue to be through Congress and possibly uh, depending on uh, election results, uh, stronger civilian leaders uh, in the Department of Defense. And Dean Cohen, you have seen this from multiple angles um, and multiple positions over the years. Where, where do you come down at this point? Well, look, there are many different dimensions to this. Uh, you know, one very important element of uh, maintaining proper civilian role is simply having a properly staffed uh, Defense Department with all the assistant secretaries and undersecretaries in place. And one of the things that, that this is really at one level very wonky, but in another level very, very important that this administration has been 
very poor at attracting talent and then staffing the Pentagon with that. When you don't, when you don't have the assistant secretaries and the deputy assistant secretaries and the undersecretaries in place who are capable, effective people, then guess what? The joint staff ends up running the Pentagon. So that's one thing. I would say the second thing, I, I would go back to the issue of norms and holding the military accountable to its own norms. So let me go back to an earlier uh, crisis. Civil military relations is always in crisis. I think we need a little bit of perspective in that one. I've, I think I've been writing about crises in civil military relations for my entire career. Uh, and that is when you had um, officers, including general officers, making openly disparaging comments about uh, President Clinton. Actually, on the same basis that people do about President Trump. Uh, they weren't calling him Captain Bone Spurs, but they were calling him something else, uh, having to do with being a draft dodger. Well, you know, it's a violation of the Uniform uh, uh, Code of Military Justice, I think Article 88, making disparaging remarks about the commander in chief. And at the time, the civilian leadership of the Pentagon, I think, failed to hold military officers accountable to the military standard, which in that case was. Um, expressed in the UCMJ. A and that's, that is a very large part of what genuine civilian control means. I'll just say one other thing, which is people sometimes confuse uh, civilian control with pistol whipping general officers. Um, that's not what it's, uh, that is not what it's about. It is much more this issue of norms. And then making the decisions that are properly the decisions of civilians to make. I'm just one historic one, and then I'll stop talking. Uh, you know, President Truman ordered the United States military to desegregate. The best military advice at the time was don't do that. General George C. Marshall was very much against it. Uh, most senior military leaders were very much against it nominally on the basis of purely military grounds. It's reasonable to think that they had other grounds. Um, and he said, no, you're just going to do that, and because I said so. Um, and that was exactly the right thing to do, of course. And it turned out that you know, the military judgment in that case was pretty poor. It was very poor. Um, so I, I think that that's the other thing here, that you know, the civilians ultimately called the shots. And they need periodically to assert that. Thank you. General Barno. Yeah, I might just take a slight different angle as I heard the question, I think, is, is uh, how civilians, however you define them, can take a role in ensuring the military remains unpoliticized. And, and I think partly I would, again, go back, and this, this is a different angle than the, the other uh, speakers have uh, alluded to, but I think Congress is going to have to double down on defense appointees that they review for confirmation. We have one coming in front of us for the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, who is a strikingly partisan figure, retired Army one-star general. That there's going to have to be, I think, a stronger examination of these candidates up to and including the Secretary of Defense in a public requirement for them to be able to talk about how they will ensure the military remains unpoliticized, out of the business of being a political prop for the president, you know, out of domestic, you know, policy squabbles, because that's part of their role as well. They, they are, in a sense, it's not just the chairman and the Joint Chiefs who are the bulwark, you know, preventing the military from becoming used as a political tool, but it's also the Secretary of Defense. That's a significant responsibility I think he has. I believe Secretary Esper perhaps belatedly understands that a bit more now, um, but any future Secretary of Defense and the undersecretaries, the assistant secretaries, I think Congress has a role to ensure that that is driven home to them in their confirmation hearings, and, and they go on record of how they're going to prevent that from happening. Can I just jump in really quickly on that point Absolutely. about the assistant, uh, excuse me, about the nomination of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy? Um, several in the, in the past 24 hours, um, a number of Democratic senators have come out saying they will oppose him uh, his nomination and vote against him precisely because of what General Barno just mentioned and his, uh, you know, explicitly partisan political uh, views and what he's expressed publicly. So that helps reinforce that at least a little bit. I don't know what the ultimate fate of his nomination will be, but, you know, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. 
Um, uh, looking, um, uh, scrolling through the, 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 the questions, um, uh, a couple of questions have popped up, um, not surprisingly given where um, our conversation has gone about the all-volunteer force. Um, and, and to what extent do you see um, a relationship between um, uh, the lack of understanding about the military, um, uh, an overextension of its use um, uh, on the, the 1st of June, some would argue, um, and, and this, this failure um, uh, to actually um, integrate it and understand it as, as one of many important American institutions. Um, uh, to what extent is the all-volunteer force um, a greater part of the problem um, than a part of the fix when it comes to having an effective military, and what, if anything, would you change? Um, uh, General Barno, why don't we start with you, then Dean Cohen, and then Dr. Uh, ben Sahel. Yes, I think, I think the all-volunteer force is uh, both revered and completely misunderstood or not, not even uh, connected to most of the American population out there. You know, famously, uh, you know, less than 1% of Americans serve in the military. Uh, for those of us who have served, uh, we're acutely conscious that it's not just those of us in uniform, that, the 1%, but our children, our, you know, our sons and daughters are the next 1%, that this is a generational problem, and that, you know, my family alone, both my sons uh, served in the military after I did, both were in Afghanistan at different times. So this is an extraordinarily narrow cast of American society, and it's becoming further and further separated from the population writ large. It, that affects how we decide how long we stay in wars, what wars we go into, uh, how we employ the military, and whether Americans have any equity in those decisions or not. And again, this has had the effect of accruing much more of that decision-making to the executive because Congress isn't directly affected. Their constituents aren't particularly engaged on a lot of these topics because they have famously no skin in the game. So I think it's, it's a challenge for us and it will remain a challenge going ahead because we are not going to step away from the all volunteer force unless we have a calamitous national emergency that requires that. Um, in a perfect world, we might consider conscripting a small percentage every year just to make that eligibility uh, something every American has to consider when we go into foreign conflicts. I, I think the prospects of that are precisely zero. Uh, but I also think there's got to be some way to, to engage the American people more in this military, how it's used, who serves, why they serve, what parts of the country it comes from. Otherwise, we're going to have a complete disconnect between what America looks like and what the military looks like. Dean Cohen. Yeah, so the main point I'd, I'd make is, um, although I, you know, I agree with everything General Barno said uh, about uh, some of the limitations of the all-volunteer force, I think everybody has to understand there's no way we're going to go back from it. You're, and, I, and there's no way you're going to have a selective graft either. I agree with him on that. Uh, the injustice of, you know, saying to some young men and women, you know, like 5% of the cohort, yes, you, you're going to, instead of going off to college or getting a job, you're going to spend uh, three years, um, uh, patrolling somewhere in Afghanistan, it, just, it won't, simply won't be sustainable. So let's not even bother about that. Um, I think there are other things that you can do. So one modest thing that I've thought about, thought for some time is uh, that, you know, there really should be a strenuous effort to get more ROTC programs out there even when it's inefficient to do so. You know, the when I've talked to military recruiters, they like the really big, uh, the military personnel people, they like the really big programs like Texas A&M. You get lots and lots of perfectly good officers uh, in, from institutions which are military friendly. Um, but but it's, of course, it's a way to build a monoculture and it's a way to ensure that the people are gonna be this country's uh, business leaders and leaders of nonprofits and professors and gosh knows what else um, are not going to know people in the military. Whereas if you have lots and lots of ROTC programs, including all the inefficient ones, you're much more likely to do that. And I would go even further, and this is where Gerald Barno may really kind of decide that he's had enough. Um, I think there's something to be said for something like the British Sandhurst system. That is, for getting rid of the idea of the academy, actually, you might too, uh, Dr. Thornhill, change the, uh, the, the role of the academies from being four-year colleges, providing a perfectly good undergraduate education, 
uh, but not necessarily producing officers any longer who stay in longer than other folks uh, and or who are really demonstrably better than the ROTC intake and have that be the place where you go to for a year after uh, enrolling through ROTC. And I think all that uh, or something like that in the name of really diversifying the base of the officer corps, at least, um, understanding that that only addresses part of the problem. That's probably alienated both of you. I, I think exploring professional military education would be a terrific panel that we ought to, we ought to put together at a later time. <laughs> Dr. Bensahel. Yeah, I also think there's merit in exploring that, although, of course, the traditions and institutions, particularly of uh, West Point as the longest and oldest, will make that uh, extremely difficult. But, the, but your point remains valid, right, that that is a, a source of separation, uh, a way that, you know, further removes uh, the military from American society. You know, if uh, the academies produce half, approximately half of the officers of each, uh, you know, incoming cohort, you obviously have an issue there. I will also mention, because I am a direct beneficiary of this, ROTC programs benefit civilians on the campus too. You know, we tend to think of its benefits for, for uh, military officers, um, but, you know, the, I, I grew up in the middle of New York City. I didn't know anybody in the military. I learned, you know, the first exposure I ever had to anyone in the military was as an undergraduate when I got to know some folks in ROTC very well. So, you know, there's, there's uh, benefits that way that I think uh, often get lost in, in that discussion. Um, I do think I, I, I completely agree with Dean Cohen's comment about expanding ROTC programs, and I think this was implicit in what you said, but I'll make it explicit. Uh, you know, when he was talking about the inefficient ones, the the versus the efficient ones, uh, it, the efficient ones are not geographically distributed evenly across the United States. Um, you know, the most effective ROTC programs tend to be in the areas where recruiting is easier, and that tends to be in the rural areas of the country and particularly in the South. And a lot of that is directly correlated with what General Barno mentioned about, you know, military families continuing to serve. What's the greatest propensity uh, for someone to serve in the military? It's if they have a direct family member, usually a parent. So it's easier to recruit around the big military bases. Big military bases are vastly disproportionately in the South and in rural parts of the country. There's good reasons to do this beyond uh, just the diversity of views in the force. It would give, uh, you know, the military much more of a representative look, uh, you know, representing the entire country at a time when the challenge is facing the military, also the subject of another panel, but are, you know, increasing uh, every year with, uh, you know, the renewal of great power competition, technological advances. You know, we need to do those things to expand ROTC to be more inefficient places in the country, again, you know, more uh, urban areas and uh, the, the coasts, because we need a diversity of talent in the force to address the challenges of the future. So that proposal has a number of really positive benefits. The military doesn't like doing that because it's harder, it's more expensive, it requires more effort. Um, but, you know, there, there are a whole variety of reasons why that would serve uh, the officer corps and the military as a whole uh, particularly well. Uh, great, great comments. Um, uh, once again, going through um, all of the, the the chat boxes and the and the, the comments, um, a lot of issues have been raised about Congress's role, um, and and I think I've got a, a two finger from Dave on the previous. Okay, we're, we'll keep West Point at least for the next academic year. Go one, ahead. One, one quick comment, and you will appreciate this as well. Uh, there, Dr. Thornhill was an Air Force Academy grad. That's not necessarily well understood about the service academies, though, is they they actually don't have the ROTC regional problem. They draw directly from every single congressional district in the United States and its territories. So you're guaranteed a nationwide distribution of population in the service academies each year that you don't get in any way, shape, or form in ROTC. Not the you know, defend that on that merit alone, but it, but that is the reason where there are people from New York City in large numbers at West Point and from Chicago and from Los Angeles who would not probably be there throughout the city. Okay, Dean Cohen, you get a two finger, but I'm going to tell you, we'll keep the service academies open at least for the next few years. So don't worry. Uh, Dean Cohen. <laughs> so this, is a, this is a losing battle, but as a Dean, I get used to those. Uh, 
and, and also uh, uh, irritating my colleagues. Um, I think that's true, but let, you know, let's remember that if you offer full freight, which RT scholarships do, plus a stipend, and you scatter those around the country, you're gonna get plenty of geographical representation. I promised your own Barno that I will keep my mouth closed on this one for now. And, and, and I'm sure that we will be exploring, um, there is a lot of interest, uh, uh, I, I know from the folks that are in the webinar as well as the faculty on actually how you create and educate and sustain um, uh, not only the officer corps, um, but build a very effective um, NCO course. So that is a rich topic for a later conversation. But it is a great segue into um, this issue of, of the role of Congress, right? Um, and and some of you, some of the panelists have talked about specifically um, uh, Congress's role or lack thereof, um, especially related to the, the, the most recent events. Um, as, I, as I look through the participants' um, comments, there's a lot of interest in terms of, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the silent branch of government right now. Um, what is it from a civ mill perspective um, that you would like to see um, uh, Congress do? Not just this Congress, but subsequent Congresses, you know, after, um, after the election. Um, and Dr. Bensahel, since you were the best behaved of the last group, um, uh, we'll, we'll start with you. No, 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 you should go to my, my feisty colleagues there. Um, honestly, I'm not sure what else to add. I mean, I, I do, as I said before, I do think that future Congresses, potentially as early as this fall, depending on how the elections turn out, are going to look to limit executive power uh, over the military in certain ways. I mentioned, you know, revisiting uh, the parameters of the 1807 Insurrection Act. Uh, I think they may put in some more formal uh, constraints on that power. Uh, the more directly tied it is to recent events, I think the easier it will be if you're, you know, talking about, you know, dealing with things that are more long-standing traditions. I don't think you're going to see, uh, you know, as much energy on those. But ultimately, it comes back to what Dean Cohen said. Congress is not a functioning institution, period, right now. And so, you know, it has to regain that in order to be able to address any of these issues that we're talking about at all. So I, if I could, I'd, what I'd add is, um, I think there's a general issue sometimes in the discussion of civil military relations uh, that we tend to, uh, those of us who are you know, interested in these subjects tend to really focus in and, and fail to set enough context. I mean, the larger context in which this happens is this context of Congress ceding uh, authority to the executive. And that, you know, that's true in, say, the treaty-making power. When was the last time Congress got up on its hind legs and told the president, you can't make an agreement without having it in the form of a treaty that then has to be ratified by the Senate? And the truth is, Congress was just as feeble on this one in dealing with the Obama administration, uh, or actually any of the prior administrations. So it is part of a, a much larger and more complicated context. And I think it would be a mistake to try to address these in excessively narrow terms. If, if I might say, and this is more of a scholarly point, um, in the same way that when we've talked about military professionalism, which is a, a very much the subject of the literature and uh, of internal debate within the military, we have to remember the very notion of professionalism and professional expertise. This is a part of a set of much larger developments in civil society over the past century and a half where people began to think about things like medicine or law or engineering or military service as professions. And, and I think it's incumbent on all of us who are you know, writing and thinking about this to, to try to turn to that broader frame whenever we can. Thank you. General Barno. Yeah, I think the, I would agree with all the comments that have come before. I think um, there is hope at least that we will see uh, perhaps as a, re as a reaction finally to this administration, but also as a reaction to what we saw in the Obama administration, the Senate in particular and the key players in the Senate, whether it's the majority leader or the, the senior members of say the Senate Armed Services Committee 
taking a very strong role in trying to reverse some of this domination by the executive branch. And part of that's driven, frankly, by the unique dynamics of the Trump administration and the amount of power that this particular president wields over every Republican in the House and the Senate and the risk they take in pushing against him. I think that's, that's probably just the pinnacle of what we've seen over the last uh, 15 years or so. But, but until we find you know, somebody like a Senator John McCain who could become the chairman of the, the uh, Senate Armed Service Committee or someone in his ilk, maybe Jack Reed, who's a West Point graduate and a former Army officer you know, taking that over if, if uh, the Democrats come into the majority, that would be a different different domain than what we've seen before. But that, that's where the erosion has hurt us the most. If I could say one thing, one big problem with Congress is getting, in today's Congress, getting people to stare down presidents of their own party. And the, the, at the moment, the issue is the cowardice of the Republican uh, uh, National Party. It's not very different for the Democrats. It's a bit different, but it's not as different as we might like to think. Um, and you're dependent on outliers like the John, uh, the John McCain's of this world. But, but that ultimately is the critical thing. If people are willing to talk, look at somebody who's on their side and say, this is wrong, and we're going to oppose you, and we're going to insist that you adhere to the norms of American governance. Thank you. Um, and uh, for those of you who are listening, just so you know how um, we'll wrap up the session, um, I, one more question, um, uh, sort of an inclusive question for the panelists. Um, and then I've asked them um, to give uh, just sort of final thoughts um, and promise to wrap up everything promptly at um, uh, 1215. Um, the final question is a conglomeration of some of the comments um, uh, that we've gotten from participants about the impact overseas um, and, and how should, and, and how should um, uh, Americans and how should the military think about um, what happened on the 1st of June and subsequently overseas. Um, in particular, we have um, one graduate, Nick Schifrin, um, who asked the question with regards to Germany and the president's unilateral decision um, to pull troops, some troops out of Germany. Um, what should the military be doing there? Should it be slow rolling him? Should it be um, executing the decision promptly? How should the military proceed? And then another participant asked the question um, uh, with regards to um, how other countries, in particular India um, or China, might be viewing um, what happened. Um, so it is a wide open question um, uh, for, a, for a very talented panel. Um, and Dr. Bensahel, I'm going to start with you. And, and I know it's too much to take on in its entirety, but I encourage you to take on uh, the bit of that question that that you like the most. Um, and then uh, General Barno, uh, Dean Cohen will let you have the final word on that question. Yeah, you're right. That's a, a huge set of questions. Um, I will focus on the uh, piece, I think, of, of overseas credibility and, and what does this mean and in, in how we're perceived overseas. Um, you know, this crisis is happening during an extraordinary moment in American history. I mean, uh, you know, we are at a period of national crisis, the likes of which have not been seen since, uh, you know, in, in, in decades, right, with the combination of the pandemic, with uh, the economic crisis that is roiling the country, with the racial protests on top of that that have come out. Um, so, you know, in terms of how this affects the U.S. credibility overseas, U.S. credibility was already suffering immensely, not just from uh, the actions of the Trump administration, you know, coming into office saying he was uh, on an America first platform, but really, uh, you know, the, the way that the United States has been dealing with the pandemic, the fact that the U.S. has been so unprepared and that casualties here are, uh, are higher than anywhere else, uh, almost anywhere else in the world. Um, so American credibility was on the wane uh, and is making both of our allies and adversaries, uh, you know, recalculate their relationship with the United States. Um, so this just adds to that. It will in the future inevitably make it much harder for the United States to talk about civilian control over the military overseas and a country uh, that, you know, that's a value and a norm that the U.S. traditionally tries to uh, help inculcate around the world. 
um, any country uh, will, will potentially perceive the U.S. as being hypocritical on that because all they have to do is show that one image, no matter how much the chairman and the secretary have walked back from it, it really undermines our ability uh, to reinforce that around the world and helps erode our moral standing in an awful lot of ways. Terrific. General Barno. Yeah, maybe just take the po point on the uh, withdrawal of troops from Germany as an example. In, uh, you know, you asked the question, what should the military do about this? The, the military should, at this point, salute and move out and find out how to perhaps mitigate that as much as possible with allies, maybe look for other places in Europe that those troops could go. But, but as you'll recall, uh, as we all recall, Secretary Mattis actually resigned in a similar circumstance here two years ago when the president abruptly, without any anticipated, uh, and perhaps no staffing, no, no deep thinking on it, decided to remove all U.S. troops from Syria, which caused uh, you know, Secretary Mattis to, to put in his papers and leave office very, very soon thereafter. Um, no one's going to take that step this time, but I think this decision is the same kind of uh, abrupt, no preparation decision, perhaps, in, you know, some were reported in a, a fit of peak against a Angela Merkel in Germany for not coming to the G7 in June. Regardless, it's, it's a huge blow to U.S. prestige overseas. The military simply has to move out and, and execute those orders and find ways to, to mitigate them. They, they can have the arguments ahead of time. In this particular case, there probably was no ahead of time to make the arguments because I think the Pentagon was as surprised as anyone else. But the military doesn't have a role in simply not doing what they're ordered to do if the orders are legal, which is the case here. Dean Cohen. A uh, somewhat different perspective. <clears throat> Again, I think the answer lies in much broader context, which is uh, the general impact of this administration's behavior overseas. <clears throat> but it, to be, um, you know, as somebody who has pretty good uh, credentials as a critic of this administration, I think we all need to understand that uh, for several administrations now, the United States has not looked like a particularly forceful or effective leader, whether it's leading from behind or the, the Iraq war, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and those are what damage um, our credibility in the, in the game of international politics. I, I would also say that I think the most powerful images are not, I don't think people particularly care about uh, General Milley crossing Lafayette Park. It's uh, uh, the death of George Floyd. It's similar events like that. It's demonstrations. It's the, the, the question of race relations in the United States. And, and there, I think that for me, the thing that's most striking is the resonance that those events um, have had abroad, which tells me that actually people still expect the United States to stand for certain things. And um, people don't have those reactions overseas if that happens in Russia or um, uh, some other country. They have a reaction when it happens in the United States. And I think it's because people take us at our word. And the word, you know, date we're coming up on is in the Declaration of Independence about what we think uh, free government is all about and uh, people's rights and liberties. So perversely, perversely, there's a certain kind of good news, I think, in all that. Powerful note um, to end on. We have um, two minutes. Um, so um, a rapid fire, same round. Um, Dr. Bensahel, General Barno, and then Dean Cohen for final thoughts on what do you want the participants um, uh, to take with them from this event? Yeah, I think that the immediate crisis that, that we were looking at on the 1st of June and in the subsequent days seems to have subsided for now. I'm, no, I'm nowhere near as, nearly as worried about this as I was on uh, January 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. Um, and again, because we, as we talked about at the beginning, I think both Millie and Esper have walked this back to the best of their ability. But they can't walk it back completely. And I do think we're going to be dealing with the consequences of this, whether it ends up in more congressional action, whether it ends up in more uh, 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 you know, questions uh, and issues about congressional testimony and just the perceptions of the American people about the appropriate role of military and society. We're going to be dealing with those implications for a very long time to come. Thank you. General Barno. Uh, my message, I think, for the audience would be that uh, the U.S. military takes this issue of civil military relations very seriously, that they believe very strongly in their role as an apolitical institution 
within uh, the government of the United States, perhaps more so than any other institution uh, that's affiliated with the government in the country, and that they will be looking at this very carefully about what lessons they can draw from it, how they educate their population, how they enforce and discuss and make clear the norms that they expect, not only of those that are serving on active duty, but as much as possible extended to those that are retired and still very visible out there in the population. So I think General Milley did that well here when he, not in his initial uh, actions, but certainly in how he realized the impact of those and ultimately apologized for those. And I think that'll be a huge lesson the military will take on board. Dean Cohen, final word. Um, I think really my only final word is to think about this in larger contexts. Uh, that as we react to any particular event, to step back and put it in big picture. And one thing I'll say is to thank you and uh, Dr. Carlin for really running a wonderful, lively, uh, and uh, thought-provoking panel. Thank you. And on that note, what I would like to say um, uh, to the participants, um, uh, all of you out in webinar land or Zoom land or whatever it is, um, thank you for hanging with us. Um, I was immensely impressed with the quality of the questions in the chat, and I apologize um, for not getting to those. Um, and uh, to our panelists, as usual, um, learned a ton, unbelievably insightful. It's an important conversation. It's a continuing conversation. And to the SICE events team and everybody, I just say thank you. So um, signing off here and um, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you so much.